How do you spend your time on the road? Is driving a relaxing experience or a stressful one? Do you travel with others and socialize? As a passenger, do you work or play on a device? Or do you simply watch the world go by? Have you ever wondered how this might change in a self-driving car? In a partnership between San Jose State University's Anthropology Department and the Alliance Innovation Lab at Nissan in Silicon Valley, our team of four applied anthropology graduate students set out to research user experiences inside vehicles to inform the way cars are designed in the future. We set out to conduct interviews and observations to understand the experiences of Silicon Valley commuters inside vehicles. We wanted to know more about the way this time is spent, especially for passengers. For example, how do different configurations of passengers, such as a family on a road trip or a solo commuter, use space differently? What do these different use cases look like spatially? When are passengers focusing their attention inside the vehicle on other passengers or a device, and when are they focused on the environment outside? How do these experiences differ in the shared spaces of public transit? To explore these questions, we interviewed a diverse group of Bay Area drivers, passengers, public transit riders, family members, students, workers, veterans, and people who customize their vehicles. We asked questions about their routines, their time in vehicles, and the challenges they encounter along the way. We joined drivers on their trips and observed passenger behavior and daily operations on public transit. Additionally, autoethnography gave us tools to put our own experiences in a broader social context. We looked for patterns across the data from various sources and built on these patterns to make recommendations on how autonomous vehicles, or AVs, can meet diverse needs in the future. Many drivers and passengers expressed a desire for control over their routes, schedules, and personal space inside a vehicle. Commuting in the Bay Area always involves giving up some measure of control, whether that means encountering traffic or relying on indirect public transit routes. Jenna, a solo commuter and traveler, discussed her experience driving. I have the control you know and you always feel at ease when you're in control. In these cases, respondents expressed a sense of ease and safety associated with controlling their own vehicle. Drivers and passengers also noted their relationship with the space around them. In some cases, drivers actually appreciated their time commuting. Mojade, a driver and solo commuter states, I think of my routine as my me time, to be honest. And it's the only me time I get throughout the week, so I think it's very therapeutic. Me driving in my car, listening to music, and running my errands. Instead of thinking about commute time as a sacrifice to get somewhere, drivers tended to view the time as a much-needed break in an otherwise hectic schedule. They pay attention to their comfort, listen to music, and get a break from the needs of work or family. Similarly, we noted how different configurations of passengers use the space inside a vehicle differently under various circumstances. As noted before, solo drivers like Mojade take advantage of the comfortable space and atmosphere inside their vehicle to relax. For some, like Jose and Jenna, a comfortable space means having ample room. For example, Jenna says, I have two dogs, so I need enough space to fit my dogs in there comfortably. Meanwhile, Jose says, My family always takes my car because it's just bigger and more comfortable. For others, food is a vital part of their experience. When Mojade travels with her father, she likes to chill in the back and just eat and listen to Indian music. Unlike drivers, passengers use their time in vehicles as an extension of their lives. Santiago mentions, I make my partner drive, and then I do work in the car, so it's my little mobile office. Meanwhile, Jose, a Silicon Valley teacher, says, I spend the time inside the car thinking about lesson plans, work, and things like that. Such uses of vehicle space have likely become more widespread with the post-pandemic shift to remote work and learning. Still, other configurations of passengers, like families and friends, use vehicles as a social space. 
A mother like Maritza, with children in the back seat, said her experience could be enhanced with family time and being able to play board games with the kids in the car. For those on long-distance road trips and individuals living the van life, a popular social media term for those who live and work in their vehicle as they travel, self-sufficiency is essential. These travelers spend significant time in their vehicle, either in the short term for road trips or long term for full-time van lifers. As a result, they often modify their vehicles to be more comfortable for activities like sleeping, cooking, everyday living, and other needs that regular commuters may not consider. Our researchers drew on both their own experiences and those of interviewees to investigate what this looks like in practice. Portable appliances and power stations with solar panels allow for food preparation on the road, saving money, and offering a more balanced diet. Window coverings and modified back seats allow for privacy and sleep. Communication systems can be added for emergencies in remote areas with no cell service. This represents a very different set of needs from regular commuters, all to achieve self-sufficiency, safety, and reduced costs. Several of our respondents discussed their use of the area's public transit system, and our team spent time riding buses and making observations. For these commuters, getting from point A to point B often requires a slow, indirect journey. Trains and bus lines mostly service narrow corridors, yet Silicon Valley is sprawling with homes and workplaces spread out. Trips often involve multiple transfers, each with potentially long waits exacerbated by unreliable timing and unexpected delays. Elena described a daily commute with three separate buses and trains. She said her bus will sometimes arrive overcrowded, forcing her to wait. She also said she is often forced to fill the gaps in her commute with private ride-sharing services, despite the cost. Sometimes it does just cancel on me, and I'm like, oh shoot. I just quickly order an Uber, and I'm like, whatever, it is what it is. Jose explained why he still opts to drive despite concerns about rising gas prices. When gas started getting really expensive, a couple years ago, I looked into a possible bus route, but an hour and a half bus ride with three different buses could not compare with a 25 minute direct drive. Most of our interviewees chose to drive as a result and in our observations, public transit was often a last resort for those with limited choices and resources. Another pattern involved questions of safety riding public transit. Elena described other riders staring at her and she witnessed another passenger receiving unwelcome comments from a stranger. While she said she feels safe on buses themselves because there's always the driver she knows she can rely on, she also described getting approached by strangers at bus stops, and she said she always updates her friends throughout her commute, that way they know if something goes wrong. In just a few months of observation, our team witnessed several nighttime incidents at Derridon Station, San Jose's transit hub. This included the aftermath of an assault, a belligerent man threatening to kill other riders, and a passenger who forced his way onto the bus without paying and then exposed himself to the driver. Afterwards, the same driver told us he had seen someone get shot immediately after exiting the bus and complained of a reduced police presence in downtown San Jose. In these and other instances, we noted how drivers were forced to solve problems that distracted them from operating the bus efficiently and called for training and experience that they may not have. We witnessed drivers managing everything from emergent medical problems to disability needs and issues of poverty and mental health among riders. One night, the driver was approached by a rider with an intellectual disability who did not have bus fare but needed to get to a hospital and later experienced a medical crisis on the bus. In other cases, drivers negotiated payment, ensured riders with disabilities could board safely, and quite often made judgment calls about when to let a passenger ride when they couldn't afford the fare. Unaddressed issues of poverty, crime, mental health, and disability often fall on the public transit system already struggling to maintain efficiency and reliability in sprawling Silicon Valley. Despite its potential to reduce carbon emissions in traffic, this makes public transit a last resort for most. 
Our team's insights could inform the development of AVs in the future. Drivers and passengers use the interior of vehicles for much more than getting from one place to another. A solo commuter might view their time in the car as a refuge from daily obligations, a time to give their mind and body a rest from the day. They might want their vehicle to be comfortable, to easily integrate with their devices, and offer features like high-quality audio. But on the weekend, that same driver might want a vehicle that's conducive to their family spending quality time together. For example, front seats that could swivel to face toward the back seats, an adaptable interior may appeal to these users in the future. Many passengers want to use their time productively with comfortable seats, Wi-Fi, and device support. Commuters often value their time as an opportunity for rest, productivity, or socializing. This wasn't often the case for public transit riders. For these respondents, concerns over reliability, safety, and delays made commuting a stressful experience. And many respondents explained that they would avoid public transit altogether. With Bay Area municipalities already partnering with companies like Waymo and Tesla, AV operations could involve the public sector in the future. Through ride-sharing services like Uber or Lyft, we see the logistical potential of mobile technology to help riders communicate. Instead of a narrow, pre-planned route that struggles to meet the needs of riders traveling across a sprawling region, smaller, autonomous minibuses or vans could respond flexibly to the needs of riders, taking them directly between home and work without the need for long waits at stations and stops. What if, for just a few dollars more than a bus ride, Passengers could book a vehicle the night before to arrive at their house and take them to work with an app that plans an efficient route to pick up multiple passengers. Passengers with disabilities could communicate their needs ahead of time. Instead of public transit's current role as a last resort, a shared, affordable model of AV operations could provide a desirable and accessible way to get around the Bay Area. Commuters don't see their time in vehicles as a waste of time, they see it as an opportunity. In the future, vehicle designs can take this into account and make it easier to relax, socialize, and be productive on the road.